Laura's back from her jaunt to New Orleans for the first time, where she was impressed with a lot of doors, it appears, from her social media <laughs> posting. It's Today in Ohio, the news podcast discussion from Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer. I'm Chris Quinn. I'm here with Lisa Garvin, Leila Atassi, and Laura Johnston back from her weekend trip. The Larry Hellsolder trial appears to be postponed again because of another COVID case, but it wasn't postponed yesterday. Former Ohio Republican Party chairman Matt Borges has been saying for more than two years that he's the innocent man in the mammoth bribery case at the State House. Testimony by an FBI agent about Borges Monday, though, was pretty damning. Lisa, what did we hear? Yeah, this is a continuing testimony from FBI agent Blaine Wetzel, and he talked about his interactions with Tyler Furman, who is a GOP political consultant from Columbus, and he was a regional manager of the Central Ohio effort to overturn House Bill 6. So Furman said he went to Wetzel and he said, look, Matt Borges came to me and he said, I'm concerned that Borges is pushing for information on the repeal referendum. And so they wired him up. So Tyler Furman had seven more meetings that were recorded with Matt Borges between uh, September 5th and October 21st of 2021. And in those conversations, it was discovered that uh, Matt Borges gave a $15,000 check to Furman. Now, now, a Borges at at one point told, and this was on September 13th, and Borges uh, said that this was going to be for, a, I think it was a, let me find my notes here, oh, for a, a staff reunion for Governor John Kasich. But then he told Cleveland.com and the Plain Dealer back in 2021 that it was to help Furman pay his delinquent child support bills. So uh, these meetings went on and, you know, Borges said, please don't say to anybody that we talked. And he also kind of threatened Furman as well. He got suspicious at the, the September 13th meeting at a Starbucks. And he said, you know, look, I, are you, are you trying to mess with me? You better not be messing with me or we'll come and blow up your house. And he also says, I hope you're not recording this for the Columbus dispatch. And Furman said, well, no, I'm not recording it for the Columbus Dispatch, which was a true statement. (laughs) So, yeah, and there was a picture presented of this $15,000 check that uh, he he got from uh, Matt Borges. So, yeah, it's it's not looking good. There's all sorts of things about this that, that I want to talk about. One is that Furman is the second witness that was so offended by what was happening that he independently went to the FBI and said, something stinks here. Uh, Dave Greenspan was the other. This wasn't the FBI probing. Two significant figures went to them and said, this whole thing is rotten, which is very significant. The second thing is Borges, (laughs) he's tweeting about his own trial during the Mm -hmm. trial. So he was on Twitter yesterday saying about that that threat to blow up his house. He goes, yeah, but as the recording showed, that didn't happen. (laughs) And what it sounds like is he might have been saying it jokingly, But here's the problem. If you're joking about blowing up somebody's house, if they rat you out, there's something to rat you out about. You've done something you're worried about. The fact that you're worried about being recorded is evidence of, you know, you did something wrong. Matt Borges keeps telling everybody, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. He's, this is the most damning kind of stuff you can have. I don't see what his, his, the basis for his claim is this is bad. And he had clandestine meetings. They met, you know, at, at, at Starbucks and other public locations. At one point he showed up in like sunglasses trying to look all incognito. So yeah, this is, and you know, uh, it, it shows an early intent to try and repeal that referendum that was going to get rid of house bill six. It is the definition of a conspiracy. There's money changing hands. There's furtive meetings. This was not in the public interest, and he was part of it. I do not understand why he didn't take a deal. Whatever happens in this trial will will land on him much more hard. And he, the, to claim he did nothing wrong, the evidence shows he knew. Because why else would you say, hey, you tell anybody, I'm going to blow up your house. Ha, ha, ha. There's nothing funny about that, even though he might have thought it was a joke. This is, this is really kind of staggering information. I had no idea that two people had gone to the Fed saying, 
man, this is bad. You guys should be investigating this. The other thing is the story said that he was paid to wear the wire. When did the when did the federal investigators start paying people to wear wires? Yeah, that was a head scratcher. I have not heard of that at all, and I wonder what the basis of that is. Well, and he he was cheap because in the in a previous corruption case out of Cincinnati, they paid a lot more. But I I just I never thought that. I thought they went to a witness and said, "Hey, will you wear a wire?" But now it's like, "Hey, we'll pay you money to wear a wire." It's bizarre to well, me. I think they do pay uh, informants. Didn't you went to the FBI citizens camp, didn't you? <laughs> they lay this out. I, but if but if you're somebody like a Dave Greenspan, and I don't think we've had any evidence he was paid, if you go to the feds and say, man, this is bad, you should investigate, isn't it your civic duty to just wear the wire and do the right thing? I mean, Furman is not some some third-rate drug dealer who's looking for a fix. Sure. I, I just... it's. It threw yeah, me. you're right. You're right. Everyone should do the right thing, Chris. <laughs> That's what this is all about. <laughs> and if they did, we would not That's have right. this trial. <laughs> well, what what is so distressing about this trial is that the the state house was just for sale. Nothing about this was about leadership and serving the public. I mean, it's it's really the worst kind of case for what this means for democracy and politics. These guys were all just in it for themselves, in it for the money, undermining democracy. And Borges looks bad today. You're listening to Today in Ohio. How many sheriffs has Cuyahoga County gone through? And do we have any idea why the latest quit on Monday? Layla, it raises the question anew, should we stop appointing sheriffs and go back to electing Yeah, This them? is very abrupt. Interim Sheriff Stephen Hammett resigned yesterday after really only eight months on the job. Hammett was the sixth person to leave the sheriff's job in 10 years. Before him was Bob Reed, who resigned in 2013. There was Frank Bova, who was moved to a different county position in 2015. Then there was Cliff Pinckney, who retired in 2019. And then David Schilling, who retired in 2020. And Christopher Violand, who resigned in 2022. So we, we don't really know why Hammett quit. His statement to his staff simply said that the decision was made after much contemplation just a few days before he made his announcement, he met with County Executive Chris Renane. We don't know whether something happened during that conversation that persuaded Hammett to resign or if he told Ronane during that conversation that he was going to resign. We we also know that he recently experienced a, a strange incident when he was accompanying Chris Renane on a tour of the jail. Hammett suddenly lost consciousness and fell to the ground pretty hard. The surveillance video that captured it was really dramatic. After that, the Ohio Patrolman's Benevolent Association called for Hammett to be placed on administrative leave while he receives a fitness for duty exam. You know, could have been that that tension with the union was even more intense than than we know, or or maybe he actually is experiencing a health issue that requires more attention. We, we don't know. It's, it's all speculative at this point. He'll be around until February 17th, and Ronain will then appoint someone on an interim basis while they launch a comprehensive search for the next sheriff through the revolving door. The jail is one of the most critical functions the county has, and it has been embattled now for years. Without having stability in the person that oversees it, how can it ever get reformed? If you worked at the jail, you, you never know who your boss is. And Layla, you, you know, we talked yesterday, the sheriff's boss is doing two jobs. Right. <laughs> so you've got not only the sheriff turning over, the person that oversees the sheriff is only half paying attention. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, and prosecutor Mike O'Malley agrees with the points that you just made. He, he feels, you know, that the that what lies ahead for for the jail specifically, it requires uh, stability and accountability and, and good leadership. And, and we're just not seeing that with constant flow of leadership. I mean, it's just the, the ever-changing um, sheriff uh, sheriff's role is, is just not lending itself to the stability that they need to get this project moving forward. We all wanted to get away from an elected sheriff with county reform because the last elected sheriff or the, the longtime elected sheriff, Jerry McFall, was corrupt as could be and reporting by the plain dealer elicited all that and got him convicted of a crime and run out. But and, and so it was a, a drumbeat. Let, let's appoint the sheriff. Let's get a professional sheriff. But we're 12 years in and it's clearly failing. Lisa, since you came to town, you've been pretty 
pretty steady in saying, I don't see how this can work. We should have an elected sheriff. Should this be the trigger? Should we really have that conversation? I really believe that we should. I mean, because as I've said before, the sheriff is only as good or bad as the county executive. So, you know, you've got to have a good county executive to have a good sheriff in this system. And I did see last night, uh, there was uh, one of the union representatives that represent these law enforcement officers were saying they want to go back to an elected sheriff because they say there's no consistency in leadership. The turnover has been so bad and, you know, they can't get anything done, you know, any initiatives. They just stop when the, the sheriff leaves. Can I push back a little on, have... on that just a bit? Um, I mean, go ahead. why not then just elect a good county executive if the sheriff is only as good as the county executive? And also, I would argue that the sheriff is only as good as the candidates who run for sheriff if you're going to have an elected one. And we are constantly complaining about how there just are not enough high quality candidates in the pipeline. And, uh, you know, if we are electing a sheriff, it's going to be someone from Cuyahoga County rather than, a, you know, right now, Chris Renee plans on doing kind of the universal search for candidates. So do we really want to limit ourselves to who's available within, you know? Well, there are a couple things, though. Since the sheriff was Jerry McFall, the laws changed and you got to have law enforcement experience. And the thing that Jerry McFall did, he didn't run the jail. He hired a jail administrator and said, run the jail. And then he hired a law enforcement guy to run the sheriff's office. And we generally had pretty competent people doing it. And so I'm, I'm not sure that's the problem. The pro- what we have now is we've used the argument that why doesn't this work like Cleveland? Cleveland has an elected mayor. He appoints the police chief. But the sheriff's office is not so much a law enforcement agency as it is a correctional mm-hmm. division, which requires a huge amount of attention. And it's just not working. I mean, we're, we're seeing it over and over again. And at least an elected sheriff would be fully accountable to the people for that job. If the jail is failing, you could deal with him right away. We just we had professional jail management even under the corrupt sheriff. I, OK, I, I hear what you're saying. I just want to be on the record <laughs> for future <laughs> reference that when we have an elected sheriff and we're complaining that there are no good candidates, why doesn't <laughs> anyone good ever run for these seats? Then I want to say, I told you so. And I want all listeners to get my back on that. <laughs> Layla, Didn't I have your back on this. I agree <laughs> with you. I covered county reform. I think the answer is that you do have to have a good executive and and hire the best candidate. Didn't, I don't think running for this office is the way to go. Although Summit didn't. County does still elect their sheriff, even though they have an executive. They're the only other county in Ohio. But didn't we elect Frank Bova after McFall got run out of town? And wasn't he pretty much acclaimed as a very good sheriff? I don't remember. Laura, do you know? I got to look that up. I don't think. No, I think Frank Bova was, he was after appointed. reform. But I can look that up and let you know by the end of the podcast. We did have somebody after McFall before county reform, I believe. And it was somebody that was respected. Anyway, further discussion to come. Michael O'Malley will keep crying from the hilltops. We need to elect the sheriff. I think more and more people are going to get behind him. It's today in Ohio. Health reporter Gretchen Kuder-Crowen reported on the state of health disparities as we emerge from the pandemic and what she found should be front of mind in the Cleveland Health Department. Laura, what did she report? It should be first in mind for the entire health system, right? That the pre-existing health gaps between Black and white Americans have only widened post-COVID-19. And the research comes from uh, University Hospital's Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute. So we're specifically talking about heart health. They found that the pandemic might have entirely erased any gains made over the last 20 years in narrowing those racial disparities in American deaths from heart disease. And so This has long lasting ramifications that the black community may suffer. These aftershocks of the pandemic long after Americans of other races have recovered. So everyone combined cardiovascular disease deaths during the pandemic increased by about 7% over pre-pandemic years and with a spike specifically from stroke. And you break that down, heart disease for white patients increased by 5.1%. And for black patients, it was 13.8%. And in 2020, when we were talking about the high point of this, you know, fear about the pandemic, it was 5.1 for white patients and 15.8 for black patients. 
what happened? I mean, what after after making strides, we've erased them and it's worse. What right. what is the cause? Is it transportation? Is it the lack of available care? Well, the available care might be one thing. Remember, it was really hard. Nobody wanted to go in to see a doctor because of COVID and because of the fear of COVID. And so this huge shift came to telemedicine. But if you don't have a great Wi-Fi connection, if you don't have reliable computers or smartphones, then telehealth is really not going to help you that much. And you've got to look at socioeconomic conditions. You know, poor people are tend to you know, like of the the breakdown, they're more likely to be poor uh, if you're black and they have a higher rate of obesity, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension. So we don't have a direct causation here. We're just looking at correlation, but it is disturbing. And what's really sad, and I did not know this till reading Gretchen's story, is that the state of Ohio ranks 47th out of 50 states in terms of health value, that's defined as the composite measure of health outcomes and healthcare spending. So basically, we spend more than we should, and we get worse results than we should on healthcare in this entire state. And they point at the reasons for those is because of racism and childhood trauma. What boggles the mind is last week we were talking about the folly of the county health department sending out COVID notices long after they meant anything and spending money doing so. The, what what Gretchen reported should be viewed as a crisis. It, everybody mm-hmm. in public health should be meeting right now saying, how do you quickly reverse this trend? And instead, they're doing stupid things like sending out pointless notices that, that are unnecessary. <laughs> you, you would hope, spending tens of thousands of dollars on that. Right? You would just hope that this would galvanize organization to try and do something about this quickly, to try and regain what's been lost. It's a great yeah, story. 80% of overall health is shaped by non-clinical factors. So this is not just a hospital system we should be talking about. We are talking about social, economic, and physical environments, as well as access to quality education and housing. So all of the things, you know, lead, lead in, in housing, um, education, all of the things that we care about and we write about, they're all directly related to health. This is not a standalone issue. It's a terrific story by Gretchen, the typical depth that she brings to a story like this. It's worth reading. It's on Cleveland.com. You're listening to Today in Ohio. Debate begins today on Ohio's next two-year operating budget. In last week's State of the State Address, Governor Mike DeWine put forth a number of education funding proposals. Lisa, do we really think lawmakers will embrace them? Well, there's one we know they're going to embrace, and that's Ed Choice vouchers. But as for the other stuff, it remains to be seen. So first of all, the the Fair School Funding Plan, uh, DeWine says that that budget has more money and that most of the funding for years three and four of the six-year plan will be funded. And we're currently in the second year of the fair school funding plan. So there's a base cost for all schools. And then there's categorical aid that they add for special education, English as a second language, gifted, talented programs, career and technical education, and the economically disadvantaged. Now, interestingly, the General Assembly funded studies for all of these categories, except for economically disadvantaged students. But the FSF plan working group says they will push for funding for that study this year. And some public educators are saying that they want the full funding for the plan now because they're afraid that the legislature will lose interest and the money will slowly start to disappear. So yeah, Senator Matt Dolan says that he wants to push for the fair school funding plan, but I, we've, we haven't done it in how many years? 20 years? So hmm, we'll see. But Ed Choice Vouchers, on the other hand, they want to raise that from 250% to 400% of the federal poverty guidelines. So that would mean that family of four earning up, up to a $111,000 will be eligible for these vouchers. And this is very likely to pass. Senate President Matt Huffman says, practically speaking, this is a universal voucher because just just about everyone can get one. And the Center for Christian Virtue is pushing for universal vouchers with no income thresholds at all. Senate Bill 11 is circulating. That would create universal vouchers. That's sponsored by Senator Sandra O'Brien, a Republican from Ashtabula. Um, and this would cost about 22 million dollars more for the next fiscal year. And it would cost, uh, you know, 
$50.7 million a year in the next fiscal year. So this is not inconsequential. Talking about car- charter schools, there are about 115,000 Ohio students uh, in charter schools. We currently spend $3,000 a year for poor students who are in the free and reduced lunch program. Uh, so it's currently at 1750 so that would go up to 3000 Schools can use that money for retention pay, more programs, and expanding uh, the you know, their charter school. All right. There's no way we're going to get through our agenda on this podcast today, but I want to stick with this a little longer. I sent a note out on my, my daily text account about this subject yesterday. And what came back was, was a kind of an interesting idea. What this budget does without talking about it in the macro is fundamentally change the approach to paying for education. I, we're, when you get at the idea of for our entire lives, it has been a fundamental principle of our society that we provide public education, right? That's that's just always been there. The taxes we pay go way, way back. We're going to trace it to when it first started. This probably permanently alters that, but we're not talking about it that way. We're not having the discussion that says, okay, we no longer believe in school funding the way it's worked for more than a century and we want to alter it, let's talk about that. It's just going to be, oh, let's expand school vouchers to make it pretty much universal without really thinking through what the long-term ramifications for public schools are. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, we're talking to the governor today. We Mm -hmm. can bring it up with him. It's Today in Ohio. Budget part two, apart from the schools, how does DeWine propose to pay for all the things he has put into his budget? Lisa. And the budget is about $200 billion right now. Um, it was uh, up from $103 billion and oh, and will be $103 billion in fiscal year 2024 and $99.8 billion in fiscal year 2025. And this includes federal aid and state fees. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget Director Kim Mernique says the general fund is expected to grow 2% in fiscal year 24 and 5% in fiscal year 25. And that's based on similar projected increases in sales tax revenues. Income tax revenues are also expected to be up almost 3% in next year and 7.7% in the next year after that. And they say they're relying on conservative economic forecasts, but this will be updated in June before the budget passes. There are some one-time expenses that will be paid from $5 billion in better than expected state tax revenue. And uh, so that's where the money's coming from. I don't know that it's all that conservative an estimate they're making. It seems like they're kind of liberal in their estimates of what they're taking in. And we could see changes before long in how it goes. The other thing is maybe this year's different, but for the last three or four cycles, the legislature really hasn't cared about what the governor proposes and they just do whatever they want. Uh, and do you, do we get the feeling that that's probably where we're headed again? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. You're listening to today in Ohio. Some members of the media in Cleveland are telling an irresponsible story about Justin Bibbs' budget and what it means for policing. Our City Hall reporter, Courtney Astolfi, did the responsible thing to lay out what the strategy is. Layla, what is Bibb doing? So Bibb rolled out his budget proposal last week, and it showed that he was leaving 250 vacant jobs unfilled across multiple city departments. 142 of the jobs will be vacant uniformed police positions. And it should be noted that the budget still sets aside money for 653 additional unfilled city jobs, including 206 uniform police positions. But some reporters boiled all of that down to headlines that basically said Bibb is slashing police jobs or defunding the police and blah, blah, blah. And that's not at all what this is. It's it's actually a pretty fiscally conscious attempt to prevent another year of deficit spending by being realistic about how many vacancies the city can actually fill in a year. In fact, Bibb told us at an editorial board meeting last week that waiting too long to make this decision would probably have resulted in layoffs eventually. 
And the, the truth about the police department is that staffing levels have been dropping since 2020. They fell to 1,024 officers by the end of last year, which is about 300 fewer than prior budgets called for. That chronic understaffing means the city has had to set aside money for those vacancies each year. And that has meant less for other city needs. And the city doesn't even have the capacity to hire that many officers in a year. So why keep that line item? Also, you know, cutting those vacancies l- lets the city give officers 11% raises over a three-year period to make their pay more competitive in the job market. Giving officers a raise is about as much proof as you need that the city is not trying to defund the police. Basically, you know, Bib is saying what he said you know, since he was on the campaign trail, that improving policing in Cleveland isn't about putting more cops on the street. It's about deploying them more thoughtfully. And he talked to us a lot about some of the other initiatives he has in mind that would help enhance operations. Yeah, the state of the media in Cleveland has never really been much worse. It was shameful to say, oh, with shootings and carjackings up, Bib is cutting police positions because we're not losing any officers. This is not about that. Actually, if this works out right, he'll get more officers because by cutting that money out of the budget, he has to have a balanced budget. There's, it's the law. By cutting that money out, it did provide the money for the raises. It does allow officers now to get new officers to get to higher pay much more quickly than in the past. Those jobs are more attractive. So the remaining vacant police positions, you just might be able to fill them and put more officers on the street. But to explain that, take some thought. And so people decided, let's skip that. Let's be alarmist. Let's scare the hell out of people and paint it as something it's not. And even some members of council seem to be going down that road. And it's baloney. This is actually one of the smarter things I've seen a mayor do to try and fortify police protection. And and Bibb has also said that he is committed to remaining flexible about this because the city is still waiting for the results of a you know a staffing uh, study that they did that they've uh, they've invested in uh, to find out what is the right size for this police department and he's open obviously he wants to know what that data will show and he'll respond to that if it need if they need to hire more you know that's uh he'll come before council to ask for that it sounds like he is completely open minded about it but keeping all of those unfilled positions in the budget. You could do that for years to come and you will not improve policing. So it, it is. It's very myopic to uh, to look at it through the lens of this is a gutting of the police department. Well, I also want to point out he's keeping a campaign promise. He was the only one of the mayoral candidates who said, look, this isn't about more cops. It's about smarter deployment mm-hmm. of police. And you love to see a candidate who lives up to his promises. He's living up to his promise here, and and it seems like a sound strategy. So good for Courtney to lay it all out. The story is on cleveland.com, and it's today in Ohio. We're going to do one more. Ohio saw a significant increase in the number of deer bagged by hunters in the just finished hunting season, and the number one method for getting them was the bow. Laura, what are the numbers? Well, we are looking at 210,977 deer harvested during the archery gun, muzzleloader, and youth hunting season. That started September 10th, and that was the first time in a decade that we've been over 200,000. Last year, the Ohio Division of Natural Resources reported 196,988. Coshocton County, which is a small obviously rural county in eastern Ohio, led the state with 7,500, actually almost 7,600 animals killed. Tuscaroras and Muskingum counties followed. Cuyahoga, I expected a close to zero number, but 929. That's got to include all of the programs we have to thin the deer that we've talked about on this podcast, right? Does that include where cars hit them? Is that part of the hunting? <laughs> I don't know because that was not in the percentages of how they died. But yes, the number one was a crossbow, 34% of hunters. Yeah, that that was surprising to me. I'm not a hunter, so I guess for hunters it wouldn't be surprising. It is surprising that it was such a large increase. It's and when is it's the first time in forever, right, that it was over 200,000? A decade, yeah. 
Yeah, I just I wonder what's causing that. It, 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 in the suburbs, we know we have deer because there are no predators. But I would have thought there might be more predators out in the woods. I guess we don't have wolves in Ohio, so maybe not. Uh, no, wish- and I don't know what increased because that's a pretty big jump of like you know fourteen thousand animals. Um, you can't blame COVID and say there was nothing to do in twenty twenty two. I mean, things went back to normal, so I. I'm not sure. They are apparently hunting. The popularity has increased. About half the deer killed this season were does. Bucks made up 41%. And button bucks, which is a deer with a flat top between their ears, 9%. I never never heard of that. Again, not a hunter. That was new to me. Uh, you're listening to Today in Ohio. That does it for Tuesday. I, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Layla. Thanks, Laura. We'll be back tomorrow. I, Thank you for I listening. Can I add in before you wrap up? Bob, Bob Reed was the elected county sheriff in 2009, and then he stayed on under Fitzgerald for a couple of years. And, and he was a good sheriff. And he was a good sheriff, so yeah. you can do it. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>